Hello! In this video I'm going to look at traits of borderline personality disorder in relation to some of Amber Heard's behaviours. These are the DSM-5 criteria for borderline personality disorder. You only need five of these to get a diagnosis. So I'm going to look at five of them in relation to the behaviour that these witnesses talk about from Amber. But I'm not saying she has BPD. We don't know how often she behaves in this way and we can't guarantee that this actually happened. I'm going to look at this and the other court testimonies as if they're true, but do bear in mind that this is second-hand information. I forgot to say, sorry, this video is out late. It was supposed to be out a while ago, but I had to re-record the whole thing because the air conditioning was so loud. This statement is from Johnny Depp's property manager. During the evening of the 29th of December 2015, Johnny drove to the office alone in his John Deere Gator. He had said he just needed to get away from Amber. Shortly after, Amber showed up to the office. Amber started pleading with him to come back to the house, and at that point I walked out of the office. A few minutes later I heard his vehicle start and I stepped outside. Amber was standing in front of the vehicle screaming at him and apparently not letting him get away by blocking his path. Then she climbed into the vehicle, he drove her back to their house. I got in my golf cart and went to the cafe which was a short distance from the house. I called Christy Dembrowski, Johnny's sister, as I was unsure how far this would go. While I could not hear what caused the fight, Amber repeatedly berated him with increasing ferocity. She was insulting him, calling him names, and in the middle of this onslaught, I heard her say specifically, your career is over, no one is going to hire you, you're washed up, fat, you will die a lonely man, and also screaming things that were incomprehensible. At some point, Johnny tried to leave again as they were now in the parking lot. He repeatedly asked for the key for the vehicle, which she had taken out, refused to give back to him, and which we later found in the house. He was responding to her verbal attacks by saying, go away and just leave me alone. Amber's screaming and berating rose to a fever pitch and Johnny continued to yell, go away and leave me alone. It's interesting how she's getting more angry when all he's doing is asking her to go away. I asked Christy what I should do and she said I should keep an eye on the situation. As Amber's rage continued to escalate and I described the scene to Christy, she said that I needed to intervene and I should go to Johnny's assistance. I hung up and immediately ran to the parking lot. I saw Amber lunge at Johnny, clawing, tugging and aggressively pulling him. He continued to stand there yelling at her to stop and leave him alone. When he stepped back to leave, her onslaught would start again. So notice that it's every time he either talks about leaving by saying leave me alone or he goes to leave that she gets more angry. During this entire incident, I never saw Johnny hit Amber or push her back, nor did he physically react to the attacks. She would calm down and hug and apologise. Then he would say he needs to leave and it would start again. Finally, I stepped between them. She continued to reach for him, but maybe my presence stopped it. So Amber Heard got more angry when Johnny Depp was saying to her to leave him alone and to go away. That made her more angry. When we hear them talking about this, she actually says to him that she can't control herself when he leaves the room. You know, if they're having an argument and he goes, she can lose control and she can't promise that she's not going to hit him again. And, and he explains that he leaves because she... She is out of control. That's why he leaves, you know. He doesn't want to be there when she's throwing things at him or um, shouting abuse at him. So that's why he leaves. And then, of course, she gets more angry. This is another example of Amber Heard having a huge angry reaction when Johnny Depp leaves, you know, when he leaves the house. I got to the door at around 1.30, 2pm and knocked, but there was no answer. I could hear the ruckus inside. I opened the door, which wasn't locked, and saw Johnny in the foyer area of the house. He and Amber were screaming at each other. She was wearing a sort of green silk night thing. You might call it a slip. I shouted at Johnny words to the effect of, come with me, you're coming with me. I then took his arm, trying to move him out, but he broke away. I said again words to the effect of, Johnny, come with me. It wasn't easy, but I did get him outside. 
I had the car door open and when we were outside, Johnny said to me words to the effect of, look at my finger. She's cut my effing finger off. She smashed my hand with a vodka bottle. I saw his finger and it was a mess. He also told us that she had put a cigarette out on his cheek. I could see the mark on his face. Amber appeared at the door and then came close to the car, screaming and crying, calling out words along the lines of, are you just gonna leave it like this, you effing coward? Then she was saying, I love you, I love you. Is this how you're gonna end this? She was not making a lot of sense. One second she was begging Johnny not to leave the house and then she was screaming at him for running away. She was absolutely hysterical. I was worried that she might start throwing objects at Johnny or myself as I had seen her throw objects before. For example, I had seen her lob a fork in Johnny's general direction once and another time I recall she threw a lighter at him, another time a can of coke. I knew that we needed to get out of there as soon as possible. I could see Amber's face very clearly. She did not have any marks on her face or arms. She didn't look in any physical distress. I was much more concerned about Johnny. He was obviously in emotional distress and panicking. He wasn't that drunk or out of it though, and was easily standing on his own and having a conversation. Why is she so scared of being abandoned? I mean, you know, if you're gonna injure someone in those two horrible ways, then, why would them running away even feel like abandonment? You know, wouldn't you expect it? <laughs> wouldn't you expect that either they're gonna do something horrible back to you, or they're gonna try to escape the craziness, you know, and, and, uh, and getting injured any further? So why would that even feel like abandonment? People who have BPD will often make frantic efforts to keep the person from abandoning them. So they can fight them, they can be really aggressive, uh, or they can be really loving. You know, there's this push-pull dynamic going on. When we have a phobia of something, we can, um, you know, really blow up a, a very tiny thing and, and it can feel like it's worse. So if you're afraid of spiders and you see a picture of a spider, that can already give you a reaction, um, you know, because you're afraid of the real thing. So for someone with BPD, anything that feels anything like abandonment, they're gonna have a big response to. So someone walking out of the room when you're having an argument could feel the same as somebody ending a relationship with you. This is taken from the witness statement of Amber Heard's housekeeper, Kate James. From observing Amber and Johnny from the start of my employment, it seemed as though Amber was smothering him. She would follow him everywhere. She appeared to be constantly worried that he might leave her and would try to be in his physical presence as much as possible. Even when Johnny Depp was spending time with his friend who lived next door, Amber Heard found that unbearable. According to one of their audio recordings, it sounds like Amber Heard hit Johnny Depp when he got home and that she blamed this on the fact that he shouldn't have stayed so long with his friend next door. I'm in the middle of a massive thunderstorm, so that's why the sound is so bad. Their identity um, is formed in their relationship with somebody else. So on their own, they don't feel like um, a whole person. They don't feel like they really have a strong identity or a strong sense of self. When they were children, they would have experienced trauma um, and they would have experienced not having their feelings validated. So that means that when they had feelings about different things, there was no one there to help them to take those feelings seriously. You might have a parent who's depressed, um, who isn't emotionally available for whatever reason. You might have a parent who um, doesn't want to feel your feelings because they don't want to feel their own pain. So they, they don't recognize any feelings you have that they don't want to see. If you have a baby and you hold the baby and look at the baby's face, you're gonna, if you can feel empathy, then you're going to follow the baby's expression. So you'll smile when, when he does, you know, or she does. 
um, and then when the baby cries, your face will change as well. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll have a sad expression. And the reason we do that is because we're mirroring how the baby is responding. So we need to have that not just as babies, but as children as well. We need to see that our feelings are reflected back. You know, if a baby looks at, looks at his mum and she's smiling when he smiles, then he'll know that um, you know, that the smile means something, that what he's experiencing has meaning and it get you know, it gets a reaction from other people. So it's taken seriously. And so it's real. And so that's how we grow as people. We build on our feelings and thoughts. We get to know ourselves through having people react to us. For, for other people um, who have had validation in in childhood when they have a feeling they they take that feeling seriously they know okay now i'm feeling sad and maybe maybe that that makes them feel a bit sorry for themselves you know um but if you haven't had a reaction to your feelings, then it means that when you feel them, it's like being in this big um, void. It's like, um, you know, just, just shouting out and no one can hear and that your voice doesn't come back to you. It's not reflected off anything. And so it's like you're not really there. When somebody with borderline personality meets their special person, you know, somebody who means a lot to them, who they think they can have a bond with. That relationship is different to, um, to relationships with people who don't have borderline personality disorder because, um, they, they want something from that person. There's an agenda. They want to get their identity and their sense of self from that relationship. And so as a result, um, it's quite a parasitic relationship. Part of my role at the beginning was to help with the redesign of Amber's duplex apartment. Amber had decided to transform it into a very bohemian vibe and had an interior decorator, Laura Divineer, working on it to change the look completely in that way. I believe Laura was practically working for free in the hopes of generating more clientele, i.e. Johnny, as a result. When I first visited Johnny's house, I couldn't believe how similar it was to what Amber was in the process of trying to create. It was almost identical. She went on and had Laura purchase an old-fashioned typewriter after she saw that Johnny had one. She threw away all paperback books and began curating an extensive collection of first edition hardcover books, which I believe Johnny purchased for her at great expense. I found all this behaviour to be quite bizarre. When I first met Amber, her clothing style was what I would call preppy. Very soon afterwards, that also drastically changed almost overnight as she tried to morph into a bohemian way of dressing, wearing more and more silver jewellery, eventually adding a repertoire of hats, which also appeared to me to be mimicking Johnny's style. For Amber Heard, she's met Johnny Depp. He's this creative person who's really, you know, he's clearly got his own mind. He knows what he likes and what he doesn't like. He's got his own distinctive style and people take him very seriously or, or they did, you know, before all of this happened. So for Amber Heard, that's very reassuring. You know, that's a, that's a real person that she can, um, she can copy, you know, if she copies his style, um, then she knows she's copying the style of a real person who's respected. So she knows she must be doing it right. Once that relationship is over, um, she's going to feel again, like she's not really there you know, that there's no one really there. She, she hasn't got an identity and she's going to have to find somebody else to find that identity again. That's going to be a different identity. So, so it makes sense when you, when you think of it like that, it makes sense that she's going to be very fearful of Johnny leaving her and that she's going to be very preoccupied with these thoughts that he's leaving her even when he's not, even when it's completely irrational and he's running away from her because she's just taken the end of his finger off and stubbed a cigarette out on his cheek. She's still going to see that as that she's being abandoned because that's what she's most afraid of. If you're about to lose your identity, it would feel a bit like 
you're about to die, you know, in a way, wouldn't it? Because in a way, that's what it is. You know, the character that she's created, that they're, they're not going to be able to continue on without feedback. And, and she's not going to have any feedback anymore. So, so she's just going to go back to being this person without an identity until she finds the next person to copy. So if we think of it like that, that she's in danger of actually losing her life, then it would make sense that she's going to be really, really angry with whoever takes her life. Relationships with someone with BPD can be rocky. They can idealise someone one minute and then hate them the next. This might explain why Johnny Depp's estate manager talked about how Amber Heard was going from abusing Johnny Depp, saying all these nasty things after taking the end of his finger off, to hugging him and saying, I love you multiple times, to then being abusive again. Whenever he was leaving, he became this awful, horrible person. And whenever he wasn't walking away, she'd hug him and tell him she loved him. I love you. You're my favorite person in the world. I don't see how I, I remember be. what I said at the beginning. I'm sorry you feel like you can't imagine it. But I said this to you at the beginning of this conversation. I said you're the, my favorite person in the whole world. If you weren't the most magnetic, shiny, beautiful, interesting, dynamic person I had ever met in my life, it would be so easy to walk away. But you get called a name and what do you do? That's the last insult. You're a baby. Because you start you physical are fights. You're such a baby. Because Call you the fuck because you start physical fights. People who have BPD can feel rage. They can feel completely out of control of this rage. In the DSM-5 criteria, they call it an intense anger. And, uh, you know, and this can result in fighting with people, throwing objects at people. With BPD, someone can fly into a rage suddenly. I did not start screaming until you had fucking said all the shit. You poke an animal enough, it is eventually, no matter how friendly it is, it's how cool. True. So I have not done this to you. I have not said these things to you. Yeah. I have not started the fight by saying then I'm going to get in another room. And sit. I'm not going to sit here and fight about fucking Toronto anymore. Guess what? I let it go. I'm not fucking about, I'm not fucking talking about Toronto. Not everyone with borderline personality disorder is gonna be physically violent towards somebody. Some people will take it out on themselves. In fact, most people who have BPD will take it out on themselves. But, um, but there's overlap, you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other. There are a lot of people who will also take it out on others. Um, but what they do tend to have in common is, uh, is an inability to control really strong emotions. And, um, and I think that that is a result of some PTSD, you know, that they've got this trauma, uh, complex PTSD. So, so all these different traumatic things have happened. And so their nervous system is wired um, you know, in, in quite a reactive way. And so they're not able to contain their feelings and they'll, and they'll have these really strong responses. But I've noticed that people in the comment section, you know, you occasionally get a comment from someone who has BPD and there seems to be this divide between those people who say, yeah, I can see myself in Amber Heard, you know, I can see how I used to behave or how I currently behave. I've had people email me saying that they want to change change and they've had this BPD diagnosis and they're saying I know that I'm abusive and I don't want to be like that anymore and and it's really great that you know they've seen how Amber Heard is and they've been able to see themselves in that and to want to change but then there are others who haven't liked that I'm even talking about BPD in relation to Amber Heard and they say they would never behave like that and no one with BPD would and I mean one person 
she was abusive towards me, um, which was ironic because her point was that no one with BPD would ever be abusive. And she, you know, she was writing this really um, uh, aggressive uh, comment. I've talked about how somebody with BPD can idealise you and then devalue you. This is called splitting. So if this is going on, then you're going to know about it. You, you know, you're, you're almost definitely going to know about it, even if the other person isn't um, really, uh, you know, obviously abusive, even if they just ghost you or they give you the silent treatment. There's going to be some sign that you've gone from being the most amazing person in the world to someone that they despise. And so that is going to have an impact on you. So even though the person with BPD might just be in, in a lot of pain and um, they don't, they, they wouldn't ever intend to harm somebody who hadn't done what they thought you'd done. You know, even if we look at it that way, it's still happening. You know, they are still perceiving you in that way and they're still acting on it. Whether that means that they don't feel close to you anymore, you, they're not going to want to spend time with you anymore. You know, however it's expressed, Expressed, it's still going to have a big impact on the other person if they're in a close relationship. Part of the recovery process for someone with BPD is validation, you know, having their thoughts and feelings validated, which is really important because as I've talked about earlier in the video, that's what they haven't had. And that's why this has developed in the first place. But then there comes a time, you know, then there's the next step where rather than needing validation all the time, you're able to um, criticise your own behaviour, you know, you're able to look at it from someone else's point of view as well, um, so that you don't just need people to tell you that it's understandable why you're doing it, um, that, you know, you're feeling this way, you know, for someone to really empathise with you. Once you get past that stage, then you can start looking at the impact you have on other people. If you think about it, endlessly defending BPD and explaining that it shouldn't have a bad name and that everyone who has it is a, a really good person who um, doesn't mean any harm to anybody else and they're really suffering and no one else suffers because of them. You know, this whole uh, viewpoint that I've seen so much of uh, on the internet, there's so many people who um, who are trying to tell everyone this. And in, in one way, I understand, you know, because it has got a bad name. But at the same time, I don't encourage anyone to tell themselves, well, this person is suffering. They can't help it. At the moment, they're seeing me as a bad person because they think I criticised them. You know, they think what I was doing was attacking them when actually I wasn't attacking them. But that's how they've seen it. So, OK, now they're being really horrible. But, you know, it's not their fault. They can't help it. They don't really have, mean any harm. <laughs> that way of thinking is really a dangerous way to think unless you're actually working with the person to change you know if you're a professional and you need to understand why they're doing what they're doing and you know what's been misunderstood but if you're being abused by somebody then um, then you need to be able to think about how you're feeling and what boundaries have been crossed for you and not to try to get into somebody else's head and be too understanding, you know, to accept behaviour that shouldn't be tolerated. It's not a life sentence, you know, if you have BPD, it doesn't mean you always have to have it. It's just a thought pattern. And there are some really good therapies around that can help people who have it. It used to be thought of as something that you can never get better from, you know, this is who you are and it's what you have now for life, but it's just not the case. There are such good results, you know, and um, there's schema therapy, for instance, you can, if you have that in a group, and one-to-one -one as well. I read a study that was done, um, I think it was, well, certainly within the last 10 years, and um, and it was at least 70% of people after two years who had group and one-to-one -one schema therapy didn't meet the criteria after, you know, after a couple of years. 
These are the criteria for narcissistic personality disorder. So you need five of these to get a diagnosis. And I'm going to very briefly look at five that appear to be apparent in Amber Heard's behaviour. But again, just as before, I want to make it clear that I'm not saying she has narcissistic personality disorder and that we don't know for sure that all of these behaviours have happened. Some of them are down to second-hand information. She does seem to have a sense of entitlement. You know, she's, she comes across that way to me anyway when we look at the court footage and the way that she talks to Johnny Depp as well. Uh, it seems that she feels she's entitled to be physically abusive and that he should man up and deal with it. I'm sorry that I didn't... Uh, you, uh, uh, hit you across the face in a proper slap, but I was hitting you. It was not punching you. Babe, you're not punched. Don't tell me what it feels like to be punched. You, you know, it, even a lot of fights been around a long time. I don't know. Yeah, no, I know. when you fucking have a closed you fist. You get punched. You got hit. I'm sorry I hit you like this, but I did not punch you. I did not fucking deck you. I fucking was hitting you. you can't I don't know what me. the po motion of my actual hand was, but you're fine. I did not hurt you. I did not punch you. I was hitting you. And the same goes for what, you know, that she wanted all of this money from him. And now um, in court, the way she's behaving, again, it seems very entitled. She tells people he's over dramatic and they shouldn't um, they shouldn't take into account what he's saying about her physical abuse of him because, uh, you know, he calls something a punch when uh, you know, even though in one of the recordings she agrees that she had a closed fist at the time. So she belittles him. Um, she humiliates him uh, and so on. Johnny Depp was really famous and really successful when they met and he thinks that she got together with him because of his name you know in order to get fame for herself um, so somebody who has this um, trait will only associate with people that they think are important enough she doesn't show any signs of guilt or shame when she appears to me to be exploiting Johnny Depp with what seems like a smear campaign. And, and so much so, I, I don't think it's just that she doesn't feel guilt or shame, but she seems to derive pleasure from it. I wonder if she's a sociopath. In the next video, I'm gonna look at Laurie Vallow. Did she really believe that zombies took over the bodies of her children? Was she deluded? Or is she a psychopath? So I'm going to look further at that. And, um, and I'm going to leave you with a friend I made today. It was a bit of a one-sided relationship. I think I was more interested in him than he was in me. A mini dinosaur. Mm, beautiful. Such long toes, haven't you? <laughs> so cute. Such a long tail. Actually, like a mini dinosaur. It's okay. I'm not going to eat you. It's you again.